The Unshackled Waves, episode 145. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. It was another interesting news week in Australian politics with some unexpected developments. A hostile media reaction to a Victorian Liberal Party branch motion to allow gay conversion therapy dominated the uh, news week. The Greens also announced a new policy to legalise recreational marijuana, which also gained a hostile reception. Acting Prime Minister Michael McCormack gossiped to the Daily Telegraph about the budget, earning him a spray from Scott Morrison who was dressed up as Santa on the Daily Telegraph front cover. The Banking Royal Commission uncovered some disturbing evidence. Uh, This included uh, banks giving clients the wrong advice, uh, fees for financial advice never given, uh, fees charged to dead people and misleading the regulator ASIC. To discuss the week, I'm joined by two of the Unshackled's contributors. Michael, welcome to your first appearance on the Unshackled Waves. Thank you, Tim. And you're not the only person who is on this episode. You, uh, For those watching on video, you won't be able to see him, but you will be able to hear him. Uh, senior editor of The Unshackled, Damien Ferry, is also here. Thanks for having me, Tim. Now, we've got quite a wide variety of topics to, to cover uh, tonight, but probably the first topic which sort of burst onto the political scene this week was uh, gay conversion therapy. Now this stemmed from uh, the fact that the Victorian Liberal Party has their uh, state council next weekend and branches can put forward uh, policy motions which they'd like to see the parliamentary party adopt. Uh, They're all non-binding on the parliamentary party. They're more uh, just a way for members to express their voice on particular issues. There were 43 uh, federal and state uh, motions put forward, but three gained uh, mainstream media attention due to the fact that uh, they were on uh, LGBT issues. Uh, now, I think the best way to uh, have the discussion on this is to actually go through each of the motions individually. The first one was Motion 9, which uh, said that this State Council calls on the federal parliamentary parties to seek to amend the Commonwealth Sex Discrimination Act to reinsert man and woman in place of sexual orientation and gender identity and to define them as biological and by their reproductive function as man and woman and to define sex as biological and sex as male or female. The Victorian Parliamentary Party seeks to repeal the SOGI from the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act to ensure it is consistent with the Federal uh, Sex Discrimination Act. Uh, Now, uh, I think this uh, motion here would have protected against uh, any type of uh, effort to introduce a transgender pronoun Uh, laws. And it's worth pointing out that gender identity in the Federal Sex Discrimination Act is actually what Ros Ward used to justify her teaching of uh, gender uh, fluidity. She said, well, all these, uh, uh, you know, 76 genders, they're actually covered by our Sex Discrimination Act. So it was it was ridiculed, this uh, motion, but uh, it should actually highlight that in our Sex Discrimination Act, it actually encompasses all these genders that uh, you can choose from. Yes, well that's the thing, isn't it? I mean, if they're already covered by the federal act, then you've got to look at it, and and then you look at Victoria becoming even more rigorous. And uh, as as it was pointed out, the potential to be able to wage litigation against people for using the incorrect gender pronoun is not in the federal act yet but it is in the victorian act and this motion is actually a relatively sensible one it's not really an offensive motion at least as far as i'm concerned i don't consider that an offensive motion at all i honestly don't know why uh kroger shut it down yeah, I, I totally agree with what you're saying. I mean, um, it seems to me that um, 
there is a little bit of a uh, conservative movement within the Liberal Party that seem to want to, I guess, change some of these uh, radical, uh, pre- like recent uh, changes that have come into place with gender identity and all these sort of things. And I mean, that that's what the Liberal Party as a conservative party um, should be expected of um, to, to be standing and having those kind of uh, um, principles. So it really shouldn't be... Um, seen as a radical move by any by any step of the imagination. I mean, it is really something that um, should be to be expected. And I mean, they have to represent a lot of people in the community that feel the same way. Now, let's turn our attention to the next motion, uh, Motion 28, which uh, uh, states that was, I should have said uh, which branch uh, it comes from. This came from the the Hotham uh, FEC, which stands for Federal Election Council, Motion 9, that came from the uh, Geelong branch. Uh, So Motion 28 states that this state council calls on the Victorian Parliamentary Party to uh, reaffirm and respect parental rights to teach their own children when appropriate uh, sex education and that the Victorian Parliamentary Party ban the use of safe schools resources in Victorian schools, ensure that no gender fluid or curriculum re relationship curriculum or resources that teach children that a person's gender may be different from their biological sex and that people can uh, transition be allowed in schools. Review the sex education curricula catching on early and catching on later and associated programs in particular to assess age appropriateness and that students are not being taught about dangerous harmful sexual acts or being directed to websites and other sources where they can find information about such topics. Ensure that schools must give parents full information about all sex and relationship education resources or curricula that are intended to be used uh, by the school and that any such resources or curricula only be used where parents have signed a consent form for the ch- for their child to opt in. Now, this one, it's uh, Victorian Liberal Party already has a policy of uh, getting rid of the, the safe schools program, so I don't get why this motion is uh, controversial. It should just be a given. Mm. That's right, Tim. It should be, should be a given. But the thing is, and I'm sorry, I know you're from Victoria, so me dissing Victoria is not going to go down well with you. I'm sorry, but oh, what about the gender-bred children in your state, Queensland? Oh, uh, actually, I'll get to that. Um, actually, it's funny you mentioned that. I was about to raise that myself um, in regards to the safe, the anti-safe school protest that we had up here in Brisbane yesterday. Where yeah, we had one in people. Melbourne too. Mm. Yeah, how many people were there in Melbourne? For Probably that about one? 500. Mm. So a little bit better than here, because um, we had a bit of rain threatening to break over us, so we didn't get as many people there as we wanted. The thing is, um, in Queensland as well, because we have a lot of different groups who are concerned about it. You've got Australian Conservatives concerned about it, of course. You've got One Nation concerned about it. Uh, you probably have the Australian Liberty Alliance concerned about it when they're uh, busy not bashing Islam all the time. Uh, you'd ha- and there are other groups. There's Safe Communities, um, which is a group mostly on the Sunshine Coast these days, who are concerned about the welfare of the citizenry. And plenty of other people who oppose safe schools as well, including including some gay activists, funny, funny enough. The issue with the safe schools program, it was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, was endorsed and created by Roswald and Gary Dowsett. Gary Dowsett who, was head of the department that Roswald is at at La Trobe University. Hmm. And his comment has been made in um, has been his he has been quoted in federal parliament by George Christensen in regards to what his agenda is. For those of you who don't know, look it up. Um, the safe schools was watered down a little bit, and even so, people are still very much opposed 
uh, to it, and rightly so, for good reason, because it's not age-appropriate. The program's not age-appropriate. The reason why this motion is important is because of the fact that catching on early and catching on later are still very... They're, they're basically watered-down versions of safe schools. They're, it's basically a crypto safe schools, as it were. And they're still... You can see from the motion, uh, especially Part C, that there are still some significant age concerns and appropriateness concerns in regards to those programs. I was just oh. going to mention, um, just on based on what you were saying there, right? I, I totally agree that we have to make sure that if they are serious about getting rid of safe schools, that they don't um, just do a watered down light safe schools light version, and they actually do make sure that um, none of this content is in such programs. I mean, um, I think it's quite ridiculous that um, this kind of um, material um, at any level should be within the school system. I personally think that it's a responsibility of parents to be able to teach them their values and principles within the home on the topic and that children that are going to school should just um, be taught basically the they're the subjects um, that normally they were always taught back in the day, um, you know, maths, English, and all the rest of it. So, I mean, mm. it, uh, it's not, I mean, I would say it's a fairly new phenomenon um, to have sex education within the schooling system. And then obviously to the extent that they've uh, uh, brought in new methods and um, tried to decrease the ages, so um, primary school uh, teaching it and, um, you know, the younger children and then bringing in the gender theory and making it a lot worse than what it ever was um, than when, say, we were in school when it was quite basic. basic. So, I mean, um, it, it just seems to me that it's uh, slowly, slowly that we're going to end up becoming like Canada where, um, you know, parents are going to be in a situation where, you know, they, they can get in a lot of trouble um, teaching different um, values than what the school and the state um, want uh, for, 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 for the children to be, be learning. Mm. You're referring, of course, to Bill 89 that was passed through the Ontario legislature? Yes, yes. Uh, motion 39 uh, put forward by the Menzies Warrandite uh, Young Liberals, this gained the, the most media attention. Uh, it states, uh, this state council calls on the Victorian Liberal Parliamentary Party to seek to ensure adequate laws and systems are put in place so that parents and young, young people are given full information about the psychological harms of social, medical and surgical gender transitioning, ensure that parents are acknowledged first and foremost as the ones to decide on what assistance to seek for their child diagnosed with gender dysphoria, ensure that parents of children diagnosed with gender dysphoria and adolescents diagnosed with gender dysphoria are able to freely access the counselling they decide on for their children, including counselling directed to encourage them to feel comfortable in their own body and to affirm their biological sexual identity by amending the Health Complaints Act to ensure that health practitioners can offer counselling out of same-sex attraction or gender transitioning to patients who request it. Now, this was uh, considered really outrageous uh, by, uh, by the media, and uh, Fairfax, they were able to get a whole bunch of moderate Liberals to uh, condemn it, such as Trent Zimmerman and uh, Warren Ench. But uh, it seems to me that this belief that uh, uh, conversion, gay conversion therapy never never works. It, it seems to be uh, quite a violation of fr a freedom of choice and, of course, uh, parental rights as well to outright ban it. Well, the interesting thing that I've... I've, no, I've <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, the interesting thing that I've observed from this particular motion while we were talking just before we started uh, recording is that... Um, they are only, all this is is trying to reaffirm the rights of the parents to take care and provide care to their children. The thing is, children, until children get to the age of reason, which is usually accepted at, and correct me if I'm wrong, Damien, 15 or 16, sometimes later, 
parents should have the parents do have the moral obligation as well as the legal right to decide what is best for their children. Um, intervention from child safety notwithstanding. So counselling should be encouraged. Uh, counselling should be encouraged for anyone who is feeling confused. Counsel counselling should be encouraged for people who are actually in of in a in or of a firm mind to say, I want to do this. They still need to be aware of the risks, the consequences, and the potential damage that can be done. They still need to be aware. They need to be aware of that at the moment. Are they aware of it? I wouldn't say they are aware of it. And parents aren't even aware of it either. But if they become aware of it, regardless, they should be able to say no. We are not doing this. We are not going to turn our children into uh, social experiments for the purposes of vanity. Yeah, I'll, I'd like to um, add on that as well. I mean, um, it takes away the freedom for people to choose to um, to go and seek help and to get proper counselling. When, when you are in a situation where you're feeling you know depressed and really down um you're obviously having different uh ideas and and confusion like you mentioned before i mean people before doing any radical steps need to seek help and and try and um and see if they are able to ha have people um able to coach them through this i mean that, that's the the logical thing to, to be able to do that rather than going through any um, dramatic tra transformations. And I mean, it, everyone should be able to choose that option to, to be able to, and I think it should be encouraged. I mean, these days now we're seeing our children and if you see um, a young boy playing with a doll, instead of one, you know, not thinking anything of it, they they just want to you know change change genders. I mean straight away without even you know questions asked. I mean this is how silly things have become. I mean you know um, they they're looking at really young kids that don't know anything. Like I mean the, they don't have have the the sort of knowledge to to you know um, even question their gender at such a young age, and they're they're already trying to to. Um, indoctrinate them into um, making them feel like they're something, you know, even though they're, you know, just innocent young children doing their thing and have no knowledge about the whole sort of gender debate at all. Now, as I have, uh, as Michael uh, mentioned earlier on, uh, uh, motions 9 and 39, they were uh, st struck down by uh, Victorian State President uh, Michael Kroger, who uh, rang these branches and uh, said you must withdraw these motions, which they agreed to do, and uh, State uh, Leader Matthew Guy and uh, Shadow Treasurer Michael O'Brien uh, d dismissed uh, the, uh, these motions outright, saying we'd never support uh, any type of conversion therapy. And Matthew Guy said, oh, I've worked with the uh, LGBT community to make sure I have a good relationship with them. Now, there's been a lot of uh, conservative recruiting uh, in the Victorian Liberal uh, Party to say, uh, you know, we promise to get rid of safe schools and all of these other uh, LGBT indoctrinations programs. And uh, they, they've put these motions forward in good faith. They'd be feeling quite betrayed that their, their, their leaders, uh, both in the, the executive and the parliamentary party, have basically dismissed them, not even given them a chance to debate at state council. Mm. Well, it wouldn't be the first time that a state executive has stepped in and smacked down the branches for their for their innovation. And you look at what happened in Queensland with um, not just political motions, but in regards to members of parliament or candidates for parliament being elected. They, the executive did not like the branches decision in the case of the, um, the Mughal electorate. This is back in 2000 and mind you. Anyway, the point is executives, the Liberal Party, because I used to be in the Liberal Party, the Liberal Party likes to say, oh, we're democratic, we're not like those factional labour union hacks. But they still have factions in the Liberal Party and they still 
have executive overreach. Um, the only reason that it became so public is because these motions, which are relatively innocuous, objectively speaking, relatively innocuous, um, they got mainstream attention. And so the executive, which is run by professional hacks, it's more about, oh, we've got to make sure our, our stakeholders, which is our party members and our parliamentary members, stay in parliament rather than, you know, actually allowing genuine debate within the organisation. Yes, I mean, um, I, I think it's um, atrocious that they're not catering to a large base that, that support the, the, the party. I mean, and um, like Michael said, there's a bit of a, a hypocrisy where they try and, um, you know, uh, pull out measures to, to attract the conservative voters, but at the same time they continue to pander to minority groups, um, which they then also criticise Labor and the Greens for doing all the time, yet they still um, do the same thing to, to progressive pockets in the community. So, I mean, I, I think I think that's that's a bad way to go. I mean, there is a, a bit of a, um, a, a moderate uh, push within the Liberal Party, even though there is, like you said, in Victoria, a conservative uh, um, rise. When you look at the leadership of the parties, I mean, in all of the states or most of them, the, the Liberal Party leadership and the people up the top are quite progressive or, or moderate rather than conservative. And... Um, you have that in New South Wales, in Victoria, and, and other states as well. And and for that reason, even though you have um, the grassroots push um, in your um, your 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 people in the party, the membership, at the same time, it's not changing much within the people up top. And you still have this uh, group of people up top that um, have those um, non-conservative type of views that that are, are more um, progressive on the social issues. And for that reason, they do tend to um, fall down and, and bow down to media pressure and, and try and pander to these uh, these small um, and very loud vocal groups of the, the left. Well, let's have a look at... The, there was a, another motion put forward by the Liberal Pride branch in Victoria, Motion 27, that says... Uh, that a guy Liberal Coalition government ensures the replacement program for safe schools protects all students, particularly vulnerable minority groups such as LGBT youths and youth living with a disability. Are they implying there that uh, being LGBT is a disability? That's what it sounds like there. This program should encourage mutual respect, tolerance, social cohesion in an age-appropriate way and in partnership with schooling and parent communities. So basically we're just going to repackage safe schools into something else look the motion motion 27 is actually sounds pretty harmless on the surface but when you look when you read into it more it does appear that it's the the the, the liberal pride branch as they call themselves and I'm pretty sure it's only only the state of Victoria that has a liberal pride branch, as far as I know. I mean, I doubt Queensland has one of them. Pretty sure New South Wales doesn't, but I could be wrong, to be fair. The thing is, what they're doing, they're still saying, they're still focusing on minority groups. And it's... How do we know that the... Um, the program that they would like to bring in is going to be any different from the what was that other what was that other program that they were looking at discussing it was the um uh, catching on early or the catching on later programs either of those it could be one of those as well that they bring in the only reason they're really opposing it is because it's a marxist policy and they don't like Marxist, I mean, let's face it, who, who likes the Why would a gay person like the Marxist? I mean, communists have been notorious for killing homosexuals over the past 100 years. So it makes sense that they'd be anti-Marxist. But the point is, they're still watering, they're still wanting to introduce a program 
of sorts, similar to safe schools, just without the Marxist um, impetus behind it. Yeah, I, I also think, um, like you said, it, it is not really doing any changes that we need. It's um, still pandering to minority groups. And I think really that uh, bullying, rather than having a big nationwide program like Safe Schools, for instance, or anything like that, I think it should be tackled as a, um, that each school should be able to um, put a focus a on each individual situation as is. And because, I mean, I was a victim of a lot of bullying myself when I was going through school years and, and when I was doing so, um, I wasn't in a situation where I was getting really much uh, uh, help from teachers or anything like that and um, it was something they never really uh, was able to sort get sorted out and I don't think a program, a nationwide program is going to um, really do anything but create a lot of political correctness um, and, and pandering. I think each situation at hand needs to be carefully looked at and they need to put focus on the particular students within a school and they have to um, really look at what the issue is, what's going on, uh, and how they can stop particular issues at hand rather than um, reading off big booklets of, um, of rules and red tape, I would say. I mean, th this is what I think is important, that they really look uh, in depth at situations rather than having just uh, a big program that is a, a one-size-fits-all model. The Greens announced another new policy this week, and that was to legalise recreational marijuana. Now, this was rejected by both uh, the major parties. Uh, most of the media ridiculed it, except for the ABC, who love the Greens and uh, like drugs. Uh, many cited the uh, health effects uh, of marijuana as reason against uh, legalization. Uh, however, medicinal marijuana, for example, to help children with uh, epilepsy, that uh, has uh, bipartisan support. And it seemed that there's a lot of debate about the war on drugs, but uh, but it's, uh, judging by the both the political and media reaction, uh, legalization of any illicit drug, there's just not that much public support for it. Yes, that's right. You, what you'll find is... Actually, there's a bit of a misnomer. When people talk about medicinal marijuana, they're not talking about the the plant itself. They're talking about, generally, the cannabinoid nature of it, the cannabis itself. Medicinal cannabis, it does have bipartisan support, it's true, but it's used mostly for... It's used topically. It's not smoked to provide the benefits of, to reap most of the benefits from uh, cannabis usage. It's oils applied topically, it's um, tonics that can be mixed in, but it's never, it's very rarely smoked. I mean, people say, oh, we like to, we like to get high, but the realistic, the, real, the reality is rather, is that medicinal, cannabis is to be authentically medicinal it is only topical and maybe for use maybe used in cooking cooking actual proper cooking to as a sort of a tonic for any benefits yeah definitely i mean um you can make an argument for its medicinal use if they were to do a lot more research. They've already done some research into it and seen that there could be um, benefits in in um, using it in certain circumstances. But in saying that, I think a lot of people, um, I mean, the Greens uh, are being really cocky in jumping from not even medicinal but just straight legalising it for recreational use. I think that's a massive jump for them to, to take. And even though the Labor Party are not with it at the moment, we know that they're going to change, give them, give them a couple of years and they're going to switch over because they did the same thing on marriage and all the rest of it too, that they were once opposed to it. Then the Greens come out. They use the Greens to push the sort of uh, left radical sort of reform. And then the Labor Party just wait for the public to start to shift in a couple of years and then they'll latch on to it. And then, for all we know, the Liberal Party will probably introduce it, just like, or make it law, just like they did with marriage and all the other sort of things that they've uh, been able to do. It's um, 
it, that, that's just the way it's gonna gonna work, unfortunately. But um, I, I mean, medicinally, I, I I see the point there. I mean, at the same time, you've got morphine. It's used in hospitals. It's practically heroin, but no one's pushing for heroin to be legalized recreationally. So if you were to make a medicinal marijuana a thing, you could also make the same argument that recreationally it wouldn't have the same benefits, just like morphine or heroin doesn't have the same benefits being recreational. There's also been a controversy uh, in uh, Victoria again. Uh, the Andrews government wants to uh, introduce a, a safe injecting room in uh, Richmond, which is a real uh, trouble spot for uh, dr uh, drug use. And it was initially sold as a uh, heroin eject injecting room, but now uh, you'll be allowed to inject ice, which uh, uh, a, a lot of a lot of people who take that drug uh, do become quite uh, vi violent and and uh, do do commit uh, large large scale crimes and it has other adverse uh, health effects. So the Liberal opposition they vowed to scrap the uh, injecting room and it's interesting. Uh, one of their uh, MPs uh, in the the upper house, uh, Bernie Finn. He's even gone so far as <laughs> to say uh, he supports the the death penalty for uh, a drug dealers. Yeah, that sounds like something Bernie would say. Um, I, I met Bernie when he came up to Brisbane a few years ago. He often speaks at the March for Life rallies. Um, he's a he's actually quite a great guy. His hyperbole notwithstanding, he's actually quite a great guy. But as extreme as that solution is, I think that we would probably see a lot more people quietly sympathising with that position, even though they might not ever publicly admit that. I, I, I must say, like, I mean, I, I, I do like when politicians um, come out with uh, strong opinions that aren't um, narrative ones that do do come out and you know shock people and I, I think that's a great thing that people are able to to say such things um without thinking that they have to pander and you know be politically correct and stuff in that in that respects um with the safe injecting rooms i mean i, I think it's a really bad idea that the government uh is encouraging such use. I mean, they they think well, well, their their idea or method behind it is that they're they're somehow trying to um, pr protect people and make it uh, safer. But I mean, for them to actually be encouraging these things, and like you were mentioning, Tim, that uh, these drugs, are, like ice, for instance, do cause uh, people to be violent, and. I mean, it doesn't seem like the government really is too phased on that, considering uh, all of the, the Sudanese problems that we have um, over in Victoria as well. So it seems like they, they do um, come out with policies that attract violence, whether it be in, uh, immigration issues or drug issues. It, it seems like it's chaotic at the moment, and a lot of people um, want, want to have that chance uh, come Victorian election to be able to vote them out. It seems to be that uh, this, uh, and this is my greatest criticism of the, the drug law reform advocates who would appear to have uh, failed this week, is that it's not a debate about uh, the merits of uh, prohibition. There seems to be this belief among drug law reform advocates that being on drugs, it's an acceptable uh, life choice, and these uh, hysterics uh, uh, exaggerate the, the effects of drug use, which is exactly the, the, wrong, the wrong way to go. I mean, you know, dr drugs, you know, t taking uh, drugs such as you know, heroin, uh, marijuana, and ice—it's it's it's not good for your health. You can't you know spin it uh, any other way. But I think the reason why the prohibition doesn't work argument hasn't taken hold in Australia is because the the police they actually you know, uh, don't they, they don't go after the you know, people who use drugs like. 
in the United States, if you caught with an ounce of marijuana, you're uh, a felon. We we don't have that sort of brute force here, and so we have managed prohibition where the public sees, well, you're not throwing in people in jail for an ounce of marijuana, but you are keeping a lot of their harder drugs out. So we do seem to have this balance here. And while there is this balance, there's there's not going to be any appetite for uh, drug law reform, especially with the the, the way the, the advocates are selling it. Mm, that That's right, Tim. It's it's basically a gimmick from the Greens to say, oh, let's reform the drug laws. I mean, we do have, we do seem to have somewhat of a happy medium here. It's not often that I say that about anything, but we seem to have a happy medium in regards to the drug laws. I mean, we have more of a focus on rehabilitation than restitution. So, for example, if you're a user and you get busted by the police, they will Yes, you might go into jail or you might get a good behaviour bond and go through a program to rehabilitate you. If I compare that to, as you said, America, where it's really, they're really hard line on drugs and, in fact, zero tolerance, the problems still keep going over there. Whereas here, it's a lot more, it's a balance between the um, rehabilitation and restitution, as it were. So you're right, no one wants to go down the drug drug law reform path, really. Yeah, I I totally agree with you. I mean, like, as I said, I mean, if they really wanted to um, try hard at this, I mean, they could have first pushed medicinally and then once they got that, then slowly, slowly started to, um, you know, push in their, their further reforms. But they've just gone straight away to recreational use and I think really, if anything, it's just um, one of those gimmicks that are just putting it out there to pander to their base. And I mean, you know, people that vote Green, I mean, I'm pretty sure everyone that votes Green would be in favour of, of such um, reform. So it's not really um, any shock to us that they would say this because it's not going to affect them at all with their votes. I mean, but people that don't like such uh, legalisation of recreational use, I mean, Probably not going to vote green anyway, so it, yeah, it doesn't affect them. The federal budget is due uh, next month, and there, there is always a strategy by the treasurer of the day to leak uh, all of the the good things uh, in the in the budget, and also to also leak uh, possible bad news, and then on budget night uh, deliver not so uh, bad news. But uh, this uh, was ruined by uh, acting prime minister. Uh, Michael McCormack, a new Nationals leader this week, who uh, gossiped to the the Daily Telegraph that there'd be lots of goodies and giveaways uh, in the budget. And so the Daily Telegraph decided to dress up uh, Scott Morrison as uh, Santa Claus. And Scott Morrison, when he saw that front page, gave McCormack a blast because it ruined his budget strategy. And Scott Morrison the next day said, I'm not Santa Claus. And then, so the next day, the Telegraph uh, had him as a bad Santa. And now, obviously, this uh, demonstrates that Michael McCormack, a new Deputy Prime Minister, is clearly uh, out, of his, out of his depth. And given his performance at the, the press club uh, this week, this week he's, he's, he's certainly, I, I'd say, not feeling, feeling Barnaby Joyce's shoes in very well. No, definitely not, Tim. He's definitely not. Um, filling them in at all, at all well. Um, I, I was actually speaking with um, one of my friends the other day. He mentioned that uh, there was an interview between Chris Kenny and Michael McCormack on 2GB. And in the words of my friend, it was a very brutal interview. McCormack is definitely way out of his depth. Uh, I did hear someone saying, Little Proud will be better. Little Proud will be better. McCormack is, in the words of another ex-national member, a closet greenie. That, those were his words. And it's clear from McCormack's little stunt about playing a lot of goodies and giveaways, it's actually harmed the planning strategy for when the coalition does decide to go to Yarralumla and ask the Governor-General to issue writs for the election. And, and now everyone is going to be well aware of the fact that it's just 
It's just a stunt. It's just a gimmick. It's just a vote buying exercise, and it's absolutely frustrating because ScoMo, oh sorry, Scott Morrison was going to say that there are going to be a lot of benefits. Someone actually referred to it as Christmas will come early, but that is not going to be happening now. Even if they keep in the goodies and giveaways and the pork barrel that they were planning to in the first place. Yeah, same. I, I, I actually think it's ridiculous when governments pull this sort of uh, tactic, especially before election time, um, getting closer and closer, and they, they always use this opportunity to, to win votes. And I, I, I think it just shows how fake they are. I mean, if they were really... Um, performing in the best interest of this country, then they wouldn't be giving goodies away at all. I mean, they'd be wanting to um, take on some serious budget repair, um, putting in the right reforms to try and get this country back on track. And they wouldn't be just spending money and throwing money away, whether it's um, even on, for instance, things like foreign aid. I mean, you know, the amount of money that we waste on foreign aid to other countries and we could be spending it here and, and you know, investing and, and trying to get this country back on track before looking out and, and um, into other nations and, and trying to save the world, so to speak, you know. I mean, there's, exactly. there's so much... Charity so ma- yeah. Yeah, I mean, people are really struggling. I mean, it's... Um, cost of living's going up. Um, it seems to me that they don't really um, they can't really connect with the the average Australian that's um, you know working hard and you know just pulling through, and they continue. I mean, with the amount of money that they're making, I mean, it's very hard to to be able to understand what you know struggle streets are like. I mean, and you know. To, to, you know, just think, of oh, throwing some goodies out, you know, and, oh, yeah, this will shore up our support. I think that's – it's just showing how incompetent they are and it's it's not doing any any benefit to this country. I definitely agree uh, with Michael that David Littleproud, uh, the agriculture minister, would have been a better pick, but probably – the Nationals MPs thought that given he is just a first-term MP, it was probably a, a too big a step, but he's probably handling the uh, live export uh, uh, crisis uh, uh, very uh, professionally and trying to balance the competing interests. Uh, but yes, they, they are intending the, the government for this to be uh, an election uh, budget because the, uh, the next election, it'll be called... Uh, between August uh, this year and uh, April, I think it'd be called as late, late as May uh, next year. Uh, and so this will probably be their last opportunity to splash a, uh, a bit of uh, ca- uh, cash around and uh, as always happens in uh, pre- pre-election budgets, but they, they still have to get to a, a surplus by 2020, 2021. Uh, so uh, where's the money going to come from? And they've, uh, they've also got the, uh, the corporate tax cuts they, they, they want to get through as well. Well, technically, they could actually go as late as July next year, but the longer they push it out, the more likely they are to misstep. I mean, you know, 30 lost news polls since Turnbull became prime minister. 31 now. They just lost another one. Womp, womp. Sorry, (laughs) did I say that out loud? (laughs) Um, But, yeah, look, the thing is, the budget's not going to turn around the news poll. Yes, it'll make... Malcolm Turnbull preferred keep him as preferred prime minister, but with the the two party preferred vote still heavily favouring Labour, even the margin of error is not going to do the coalition any favours. But that's another discussion for another time. And I, well, actually, you know, I wrote about my article last week. Um, what was Damien? Damien, you were saying something about cutting expenditures. Yeah, we need to cut all the wasteful spending. If you cut out all the wasteful spending, mm. especially the more than $12 billion per year on welfare for non-citizens, that would go a long way, a long way to rebalancing the books. Yeah, totally. 100%. I mean, um, cutting down foreign aid, 100%. Um, I'd get rid of immigration, continual immigration coming over here because that's causing a lot of welfare rise. 
Um, it's also um, more competition for people that are looking for work, which in effect then leads to more unemployment. It's, um, you know, just resources of waste. The, people really need to look hard at this and, and the government has to think we need to do a couple of hard years where we can't give our goodies and freebies. You know, we really have to be um, proper and, and, and make sure that we're doing a good economic job. I mean, a lot of them are very scared at how um, 2014 budget went when they um, did do a, a more of a hard line approach and they saw a negative reaction, the media going nuts um, when, when, when that was happening and um, they don't want to go through that sort of same um, situation again and that's why they're taking these really soft um, approaches to this but they, they have to do the, the hard yards otherwise the, the country is never going to go back to surplus and it's going to keep on extending, extending and I can't see it paid off in the, in the time that they've estimated it. The Banking Royal Commission, which the Turnbull government tried to avoid for as long as possible, is now in uh, full flight and there's pretty damaging um, allegations coming forward against the banks uh, from the uh, evidence that is being presented. At the, the big banks, they uh, gave uh, incorrect uh, financial advice, which uh, ruined uh, a lot of uh, clients' retirements. They, they charged fees for advice uh, not given, and uh, they also charged the, the dead uh, for advice. Uh, the CEO of uh, AMP has resigned, uh, fell on his sword, but he was about to finish up his term anyway. And the, the corporate regulator uh, at ATSIC was uh, gamed. The banks were able to mislead them. And uh, it, it paints a pretty uh, horrible picture of the, the culture that was at these banks to, to, to basically tr try and you know, hoodwink uh, their, their clients and also uh, the law as well. Oh, it's even worse than it's even worse than it sounds, Tim, and I'll, I'll explain why. The Because I actually watched some of the Royal Commission live hearing on ABC 24 on, I think it was Tuesday. It could have been Tuesday or Wednesday. It was before, anyway, it was before I went to work. And what they said was they had revealed the AMP, former CEO of AMP, had admitted that there was a program, a system, a program that was used to facilitate cl um, client information, provide advice to them, which is like any other program, but they were advertising it as a premium product and charging extra, um, charging inflated fees for the use of it, even though it, the system itself was actually comparable to any other uh, system that could be used by any other um, financial services provider. Um, yes, ASIC was definitely played. Uh, the thing is, one of the most important things to remember about the um, about the financial regulatory system within Australia, it had worked very well. I mean, we did technically avoid most of the fallout from the global financial crisis. Well, most of it. And Peter Costello, when he uh, was up for re-election in 2007 actually boasted about how our banks were the best and the most resilient in the world because we had some semblance of regulation unlike America where you had Lehman Brothers collapse and Goldman Sachs and um, uh, Citigroup had to be bailed out by Obama um, the most important thing that's come out of this is the liberals are furious the liberals are furious, the liberals were basing all of their no, no, we don't need a Royal Commission, it's all fine, based on Peter Costello's post in 2006 and 2007. But now, Rogue Nat, well, Maverick National Party members like George Christensen have been vindicated. Labour also appears vindicated. It's like, oh, you want to put a Royal Commission on unions? We're going to put one on the banks. I, I think that there should be a Royal Commission on both, personally. But the thing is, now the rogue nationals, as it were, Labour, they're vindicated. One Nation is vindicated. Hinch is vindicated. Anyone, um, Anning, Ed, uh, the crossbench was vindicated, except for um, Elaine Helm, who I don't think, I don't know if he had an opinion on it or not. But the most important thing that's come out of this is that um, 
the charging of fees to clients that as of this as of literally on Friday because I spoke I was having lunch with a, a friend of mine this afternoon and he mentioned to me that because of the Royal Commission his company uh, now has to um, make sure clients are aware of what they're signing which is a good thing as far as I'm concerned it's a very good thing that they're um, being made aware of the fees and they have to sign up for it but they're now sunset clauses in those service agreements and statements of advice that were not there previously and there will be no more charging of the dead because well how could there be because it would elapse with it would lapse with the um, sunset clause as it were one final thing i was speaking with john adams tonight i asked him that uh, he's uh, an economist he actually used to work for synodinus um back in the day he said to me that the rule commission shows how corrupt the coalition is. i'm actually quoting what worth, worth here i i worth, worth here i asked him if i couldn't he said quote me directly it shows how corrupt the coalition is they've been running witness protection for the banks for years and he was furious because he's an economist so he was absolutely furious about just how flagrantly uh, the financial industry had gamed the system had played the system and you know took the liberals for monks took the whole all of our country as monks so i don't remember where i read it but i remember was i think it was scott morrison actually saying that you know some someone should have been put in jail for that he's talking a tough game now morrison yeah, well, he looks like a fool like the rest of them. And that's the thing. I mean, Morrison was only a recent relative newcomer to the Parliament, so he didn't know he wasn't, probably wasn't as aware of just how messed up the financial industry was in terms of how they were able to gain the system. See, the things you can, what you can look at mostly is that banks and financial services, service providers, rather, they... They didn't, in many cases, they didn't technically break the law, but they certainly acted unethically. But in the cases where there were laws broken, oh, 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 boy, we, we're looking at some serious, um, serious reprisals from the legal system, I would expect, especially if the government wants to help build its budget up with fines for unscrupulous corporations. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me that um, the banks have had such a um, such a thrashing at the moment with this royal commission. I mean, it's um, where where there's money, there's, there's power. There's always corruption, and it, it's quite obvious. And I mean, the the it was good that you noted actually on um, on how bad the Liberal Party has um, has shown with their true colours on this. They're, they're flip-flopping, of course, of um, not wanting a royal commission and, and now all trying to act tough and everything. And, I mean, just look at the leader. I mean, former merchant banker himself, you know, Malcolm Turnbull. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, of course, he, uh, why wouldn't he want to protect his best mates? I mean, you know, um, he is as elite as you can be when you're talking about establishment and anti-establishment politics. I mean, he... He is the absolute, I mean, head honcho of establishment. I mean, so he would be right up there and um, be really good mates with these people. So as if he wouldn't want to protect them. I mean, it's in his best interest to do so. And I mean, um, it just doesn't surprise me. It, it's, it's the Liberal Party really um, aren't standing up for the people that, uh, say, uh, other leaders like Menzies back in the day did. Um, you know, your, your typical hardworking Australian, you know, middle class, for instance, um, small business owner, they've become a, a party for the upper class, upper end of town, you know, I mean, it's, um, and that's why a lot of people, um, you know, even when we're growing up, there's that stereotype of, you know, the Liberal Party being for the rich, you know, and the Labor Party being for the poor. And, and although, you know, it, it doesn't seem as um, stereotype, uh, stereotypical as it used to be, it, it's still both major parties really um, uh, are, are controlled in many ways. 
and they, they tend to um, pander to these, you know, corporates and to these banks and, you know, I mean, um, especially with the Liberals and they've, they've just shown uh, by by them trying to protect the banks, even though they were doing all these shifty things and illegal things, it's um, it's a disgrace. The solution, a lot of people are, are looking at how can we prevent this in the future, and of course there's been, you know, fines and jail time threatened by Scott Morrison. One more concrete solution that has been proposed is that uh, there should be a separation of the, the bank operations from their uh, wealth management arms. Oh, God, yes, absolutely. That is imperative if you want to have a transparent financial system. That is a minimum. If we don't get anything, if we get, if we get, if we don't get that, nah, I'm done with capitalism. <laughs> no, seriously, though, think about it. If you want to have an organization that is run transparently, you need to keep the wings of it separate. Wealth management should not be involved with bank operations. There should not be any overlap. Have them as part of the same organization, sure, but you have to have a distinct notation of difference between them because if you don't have that, people who are looking at wealth management, they're going to be thinking, oh, let's try and boost our money through whatever, you know, whatever fad we can do, like CFDs or options or Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, whatever. And then the people in bank operations think, oh, we can make money from this as well, so let's get on that. And then it gets all messy. And I'm pretty sure I don't need to remind the more um, more world worldly wise um, listeners of ours about the the guy who used to work for Société Générale in France and lost millions of dollars, millions of euros rather, on risky trades and said that he did what everyone else was doing. He was just unlucky with how he lost. But he was part of the operations, even though he's working for wealth management. And that, my friends, is a cautionary tale as to why we should have the bank operations separate from wealth management. If we don't get that as a minimum, then we have a massive, we as a country have a massive problem. Yeah, totally. I mean, there's a lot of things that need to be um, be happening right here. I mean, it's a clear indicating. Um, I mean, this has happened, you know, for, for so long now, but it's only starting to really um, come out in the public domain that we're starting to hear what's really happening. And it's, it's a good thing that we're finally getting to the bottom of this. Um, on what needs to be done, I think um, there, there's cer certainly uh, a lot of scenarios at play that we know of, of, you know, things that they could put forward. But one thing that really needs to be done more than anything is that politicians have to start serving in the people's best interests of this country and not um, certain um, elitist interests within banks or, or anyone else for that matter. I mean, they shouldn't be protecting people um, that are doing the wrong thing, um, both unethically and also illegally. They have to be protecting us, the people, the, con the you know, the, the clients, the consumers that um, are getting ripped off by these banks. I mean, that they're the people that need to be protected here. So, I mean, this is a wake-up call for politicians and they shouldn't be using this as an opportunist, uh, opportunistic um, situation. They should be doing what is morally right rather than just doing what they think now is, uh, is going to buy them votes or, um, or get them in a, a good position in polls or anything like that. Regardless of what um, they think is a popular decision to be made here they have to make the right decision and i think that's where they've failed and they've caught been caught as um being hypocritical of course and, and flip-flopping on the issue and it's not a good look and i mean for a um, a party they've lost 31 news polls as you've mentioned before and they really need to if they were to gain ground here they they need to change otherwise we're going to see the labor party romp home quite comfortably next election unless something is done about this god help us if that happens <laughs>
Well, it's certainly been quite a, uh, t a turbulent uh, news week. It's, it's probably going to get uh, f more rough as the, the year uh, goes on. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael and Damien, for discussing the, the week with me. It's often hard to, to manage these uh, three-way podcasts, but I thought we did it all right. Thanks for having me, Tim. Thanks for having me, Tim. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. The Unshackled was present at the Rally Against Safe Schools Victoria on Saturday the 21st of April. We live stream the event on Facebook. Our written report is now up on the Unshackled website and the YouTube videos, including interviews with attendees, will be uh, up throughout the week. Other simultaneous rallies took place around the nation, including in Brisbane, which was covered by our friend Dave Pello. It was an inspiring event, which we can hope can start to influence our leaders to dump these harmful programs from our children's schools. Our friends at Liberty Works have got two upcoming events. The first is the Sydney launch of Manus Days, the untold story of Manus Island. You'll remember we interviewed the author Michael Coates on episode 140. It is being launched by Miranda Devine on April 26 at 6pm at the Metropolitan Hotel. Then there is also a Brisbane event, a Jew, Muslim and Christian walk into a bar featuring Avi Yemeni, Imam Tawidi and Kiralee Smith with Professor James Allen as the Devil's Advocate is on Thursday the 7th, 17th of May at 7pm at Mount Gravit Bowls Club in Brisbane. Sydney and Melbourne events will be announced shortly. Tickets can be bought at libertyworks.org.au. Also don't forget if you want to take the Unshackled to the next level and score some awesome rewards in the process, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash the Unshackled. And don't forget we also have our online store Upright Market where you can purchase Unshackled merchandise and other gear for right-thinking people. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.